the prepping was that. That was the first step. It was just saying, I have an idea. I have something I'm motivated to do. And it doesn't really matter how whatever it takes to get it done. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. This is Debbie and welcome to another episode of The Offbeat Life, where I speak to inspiring individuals who ditched the norm to become location independent. We'll learn how to create sustainable laptop lifestyles from the experts that will help us achieve freedom from our nine to five. On this week's episode, I'm really excited to speak with Alex Chacon, who is a videographer, photographer, inspirational speaker, blogger, and vlogger. Back in 2012, he graduated from the University of Texas, took a break from medical school, sold all of his belongings, and drove his motorcycle from Alaska to Argentina and back in 500 days on an epic travel adventure for charity. Since then, Alex has conquered over 50 countries, over 80 border crossings on five continents while backpacking, flying, hitchhiking, and even riding over 250,000 kilometers across 75 borders by motorbike. Listen on to find out how Alex became a successful traveling vlogger. Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us. I'm here with Alex, who is the founder of Conquer the World. Hey Alex, how are you? I'm pretty good, Debbie. Thanks for having me on the program. Thank you so much for being here. So before we get to all of the things you're going to tell us about your journey, can you tell us a little bit more about you and why you live an offbeat life? Absolutely. So my name is Alex Chacon. I was born in Texas in El Paso. And that was a medical school. I was going to do the whole thing of being a doctor and the whole deal. And then one day I decided to kind of discover what the world was like, what was out there and how people were surviving. So I decided to jump on the motorcycle and drive from Alaska to Argentina and back in 500 days. I had a blog. The blog became YouTube. Put one video up on YouTube, went viral, got 3 million views. And that's when I said, wow, I was able to reach more people with one video than I ever could have as a medical practitioner. So I said, hmm. I'm going to continue this type of life. So I continued traveling. I made my next video, which got 14 million views on YouTube, and then eventually went worldwide and put me on uh, Good Morning America, put me on uh, this uh, CBS This Morning live interviews on Fox. And I said, wow, you know, this video now reached 200 million people worldwide. And I said, there is something very deep and profound about what I'm doing, and it's time to share it in a very unique way. So that eventually just became blogs and more viral videos. It became cinematic productions. It became inspirational content. It became uh, Instagram. It became Facebook. It became mini videos. It basically has now become just me living an epic life and being able to share that with people and showing people how to do it themselves and uh, motivating, inspiring, and being bringing people along into my uh, – very off the beat life. <laughs> well, that was a really awesome journey you had, especially since you were pretty much prepped to be a doctor and go into that field. What was that transition like? Was it very hard for you to make that decision once you figured out that you really loved what you were doing with video and your blog? I'm sure it was a pretty, you know, because you went to school for a really long time for that and to just switch it. Yeah, you can imagine my mom's reaction when I said, you know what, I had a, I had a girlfriend at the time, and I said, I'm going to just take off. I'm selling everything I have. I'm <laughs> quitting medical school. I'm leaving the girlfriend. And she says, what? What about my grandkids? What about your house? What about your car? What about everything you were supposed to be doing? I'm like, you know what, mom? There's plenty of people to be doing that. So I said, uh, you know, I said, I'll be back. I'm going to go off for two months, and then I'll come back, and I'll continue. But the issue wasn't never went back. Uh, so what, what was really interesting is, you know, the hardest thing about what I did and how it all started was just doing it. That very first initial step, uh, and just being mentally prepared, physically prepared, financially prepared, just to take this leap of faith and do something that was completely against the grain in my culture, in my society and what I was already doing. That was the hardest part. So when I first started all this, I really had no idea where it would go. And it wasn't until I had some success where I said, oh, I could probably continue doing this. And I kind of like it. And it was a whole process of this first 500 days traveling around the world. I went to 23 countries. I went from polar end of the earth in Alaska to the southern polar end of the earth in Argentina, the very bottom. And it took that entire process to figure out photography, to figure out videography and figure out that I actually liked it. And I like sharing 
a unique adventure and people were being inspired by me. They were following me. I even had people donate to me back then, you know, a dollar, two dollars, or they would find me on the road or they would hear my story. They would give, they would want to have a meal with me. I would meet families. Yeah, it was incredible. Just the support and what I was doing somehow made sense for those around me and myself. So that's just kind of how it all kind of began and what it transpired to. There's so many things. There's a lot of up and down that goes along with this type of lifestyle. And obviously, we all like to watch you go through it, through all the pain, through all the good things. But there's a lot of preparation that comes with it, too. How did you actually do the prepping before you started this long journey of traveling all over the world? And not just preparing, obviously, for physically, but also mentally for all of this. Yeah, so I think the hardest thing is the mental preparation. And for me, it was, you know, when I was around nine or 10 years old, uh, even younger, I believe, I was at school and I would see a globe and I would look at the globe. I'd be like, wow, this, this world is very, very big. And I said, all right, I'm going to promise myself I'm going to I'm going to explore this place. So what I did is I spun the globe around. I closed my eyes and I put my finger on the globe and I let it just naturally stop spinning on some part of the globe. And the very first place it stopped was Machu Picchu in Peru. And I said, huh, I've always heard about it. It sounds interesting. And I promised myself one day I'm going to go. Um, so prepping, the prepping was that. That was the first step. It was just saying, I have an idea. I have something I'm motivated to do. And it doesn't really matter how whatever it takes to get it done. I'm going to I'm gonna do it. So the mental preparation was the hardest part. And then obviously it was telling my mom, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this. And uh, whether you like it or not, it's going to happen. So um, I had to build up the courage uh, from age, from a young age up until 23 years old I was to have the skill set, to have the survival skills, to have the education, the knowledge, to kind of be comfortable enough in my abilities to say, okay, I'm going to go off into a world. I may not speak the language. I, I may speak the language. Uh, I may not be able to communicate or I may have the medical knowledge or, I, or something's going to happen that's going to not be good or I'm going to get robbed. So basically I said, I am ready for any eventuality. I said, if I get robbed, this is plan B. If I get sick, this is plan B. If I, this happens, plan B. So getting prepared in that respect really allowed me to say, okay, cool. I, I know how to change a tire in a motorcycle and that's the basic uh, mechanical skills I have. And I think that's enough. And same thing with personally. I was like, well, I know how to survive this and how, you know, how, to, how to cook food and how to, I'll be okay. And along the road, the basics really helped me out. And then I learned along the road uh, all the little more detailed, intricate things that have made me the man I am today. So it's a process and that's the journey I went on because I left as what I felt to be a child and I came back as a man. I learned how to change the entire components of all the motorcycles. Uh, I learned how to survive in the wilderness. I learned how to deal with people trying to rob you with uh, meeting beautiful, kind people, sharing myself and people sharing themselves with me in different ways. And so, you know, it's, that was that preparation. Then came the other preparation with the motorcycle, which was, you know, what gear am I taking? What camera gear? Uh, how am I going to share this yeah. adventure? And Alex, keeping- did you actually do all of your traveling in a motorcycle? Cause that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I'm a back, Hacker, but I'm actually, uh, I've traveled 70 countries on motorcycles. Oh my God. And that's the way, my preferred way of traveling for sure. That's crazy. What was that like? Because, I mean, traveling in a car is difficult enough for that long. I can't even imagine what it's like to be in a motorcycle. Your butt must have hurt so much. <laughs> You know, you know, my, yeah, that's true. My my butt was definitely the one of the most difficult parts of the whole journey. Uh, but I, I embody what is truly a nomad. Uh, I, I know this term gets thrown around a lot, a digital nomad, right? Where the guys who who work around travel and everything. But I see all these digital nomads that are you know working in Bali and they got this nice little lifestyle thing going on, eating fruit out of floating plate in a pool. <laughs> And I just remember the time I was in Bolivia, I hadn't seen another human in two, three days. I ran out of gas. I was stuck in the mud. It was raining. It was pouring. It was freezing. And I'm going like, here I am, stressing myself, recording all of this. And I'm thinking, man, there's people, there's people sitting on a bench somewhere writing a blog post. And I'm like, here I am filming this crazy, stressful thing. I'm just about to break my camera because I'm so stressed <laughs> out. 
That is hilarious. Well, that's true, though. It's a different, you're more of the adventurous type of nomad, and you definitely go above and beyond that, especially when you're doing all of these crazy things on your motorcycle and you go to these incredible places. And we all see that on your video. So, Alex, let's talk a little bit about your background because your family is from Mexico and you do go there quite often. And your did they immigrate to the United States? Are they originally from Mexico? Yeah. So, you know, I'm in this country, in the United States, basically, I'm just known as a Latino. Uh, that means, you know, that's a very broad term. It can mean you're from El Salvador. It means you're from Puerto Rico. It means you're from South America. So, yeah, most of my family is from Mexico. My mom was born in, here in Texas. My dad was born in Mexico City. And they kind of met on the border. And then the rest of the family just kind of followed after that. And yeah, so my, my roots are Mexican roots for sure, which definitely has helped me out uh, traveling. So a lot of immigrants, I mean, I'm an immigrant and a lot of my families are immigrant. And when I told them that I wanted to pursue something completely different from the norm, because usually with immigrant families were expected to be a doctor, a lawyer, a teacher and all of those things. And in my case, the Filipinos, they expect you to be a nurse. <laughs> <laughs> and when that didn't happen, oh my goodness, there was a lot of crying. There was a lot of guilt trying to happen right there. What was it like? I know you had mentioned that your mom was kind of disappointed in a way or shocked about what you had decided, especially since you were going to become a doctor. I mean, that's the biggest thing that we can be, right? Is is a doctor. <laughs> right, what was yeah, that? yeah, what was that like culturally and the reaction to that? And also once you actually made your career that you have now successful and where it is right now and you're actually able to make a living, did they finally accept it? <laughs> yeah, you know, once you're successful in something, everything's fine, uh, which is what happened. But yeah, I think my mom was shocked. I don't think she was disappointed. She was just shocked because remember, we are the millennials. We now live in a different generation than our parents. And I think our parents had that upbringing of what was financial security. It was to be able to have a family. I mean, this is the baby boomers. This is the, the most prolific generation ever of producing the most amounts of children in the history of humankind. So yeah, of course, th that, that's a big thing for them because they know with education and a good job comes good financial stability. So definitely shock was my mom's part. Yeah, so it's, um, yeah, it was, it, was, it was difficult. But once, you know, it was kind of jumpy for a few months. But then once I started getting traction, and then two years, three years later that I finally got, you know, the, the viral success that I needed to, um, my mom was like, wow, I'm your biggest Aww. fan. So she's not my, what used to be my biggest obstacle is not my biggest fan. That is incredible. And, you know, with any parent, they're always there to support you. And obviously they don't want us to make mistakes and they can be shocked when we do certain things that is out of the norm. But at the end of the day, they're always there to support you. Hopefully that's the case for everybody. And that's, that's the case yeah. for you and for most of our parents. So that's really good. So if you're listening to this and you're having some setbacks with your family, don't worry. Make it work and they'll be on your side. And I'm sure they'll be on your side even when you're not. They'll try to support you. <laughs> you know, Debbie, the biggest thing for me was knowing that your family is going to kind of love you no matter what to an extent. And I knew that I always had a backup plan. I said, well, if I fail, then I know how I have my family to kind of lean back on for a bit. So that to me was able to give me the confidence to go do what I did. Absolutely. That's always good to know is you have something back home to, to keep you also grounded and to realize that there's always going to be somebody there getting you um, and having your back, like you said. So that's pretty awesome. Now, can you tell us a bit more about the setbacks that you have encountered during your travels, during your journey? What was the biggest one and how did you handle it? You know, so speaking long term travel, you know, I travel probably 300 days out of the year. I'm not home. And the biggest thing for me, the first 500 days of my extensive travels was loneliness, was just being completely and utterly alone. And just being off in the world and being so far away from what I knew when I was used to. So that's one of the challenges. The other challenges have been 
well, when I first did this trip, you know, Alaska to Argentina, you're passing through Central America, you're passing through South America. The border crossings via land are difficult when you have a motorcycle. What's also difficult is being out in the wilderness and um, having mechanical issues with your vehicle. That's always an issue. But I think the most difficult part is definitely the mentality that you have. Because if you're not strong mentally, you're not going to be able to handle, you know, somebody stealing your stuff. You're not going to be able to, you know, get over, you know, a, a corrupt police trying to get money off of you and not knowing how to handle that. Or just the stressful situations of not being able to communicate in a certain language or certain way. So I think the mentality is the biggest thing that was, you know, it really helped me grow from, you know, a little kid to to an adult quite quickly, which was a big challenge. Yeah, I'm I'm sure the loneliness was really hard and obviously having a, a right, the right type of mentality to do it. And I say this all the time, if you are going away to travel just to get away from things or to escape certain problems and issues, when you are on the road, it's still going to come back. It's still going to be there because a lot of times you're thinking, right? And it does follow you and you definitely do find yourself, but to escape and to do that, it'll still come back at you. <laughs> yeah. And if anything, you have more time to think about it. <laughs> that's true. Your problems don't go away when you travel and that's, a good point where it's, you know, not everybody's meant to travel. Some people are tourists, some people are adventurers, and some people are travelers. Absolutely. There's different types, right? There's really no wrong or right way to do it. It's just finding the right setup that's right for you. And sometimes you find that out the hard way. And that's, you know, that's a good thing because then now you know what type of a person, what type of traveler you are as well. That's true. Yeah, I don't think you got to go 300 days out of a year traveling to kind of have an amazing life. You can do it on the weekend. If you yeah, want. absolutely. And I don't think I could do that either. I mean, right now, even having little breaks in between, it's so exhausting. And I think a lot of people just see our lives and they look at the pictures and videos that they see and they think that it's glamorous and adventurous and wonderful, but they don't realize how it takes a toll on your body physically and mentally. It really takes a toll on you. And doing that all the time, like you're doing, Alex, it's it's hard. It's a hard thing to do. Yeah, I think uh, a nice example of what the internet and social media gives us is that false perception of reality. And there's all these wonderful memes of, uh, not memes, but there's like these comparisons where you see this great, amazing picture and this person having a great time. Then you see somebody who sees this person and takes a candid shot and they show that this person may be not be in the same physical condition that their pictures are showing or that the, the sky is not the same color or it's over photoshopped. So it's really funny to see the comparisons between what the reality of this whole life and situation is to what we represent and showcase, because that's what people buy. That's what people sell. That's what that's what works the best in our society. Absolutely. And, you know, honestly, we all want to see those things, especially for someone who is in their nine to five. They want something to look forward to. And people like you do give that sort of scenery for them to look at and something to look forward to in the future and maybe something to do as well, because they look forward to that or they look up to someone like you who is adventurous and maybe they can't do it yet or they're striving to do that as well. So that's that's good. It's a good and a bad thing, right? Yeah, that's correct. I mean, I think um, you have to be very careful, though, that I know we all like eye candy and things that look perfect and everything, but the reality is the same. I like to think that my content is my content is not that perfection shot and my content is not that like, you know, everything's great and dandy hoary. It's just, uh, Dandy Dory, if you see my, my Insta stories, you're going to see me like, oh my gosh, I want to punch myself in the face for doing this, or man, I made a huge mistake doing that. So I like to keep it a little more real. And I think that's what kind of separates me a little bit from um, the rest of the people. Absolutely. Definitely a balance between is always a good thing. And you don't want people to have false hopes and expectations of certain things when you know it's not the truth. So it's always good to do because people will listen and they will follow what you're doing. So that is a good thing to that's know. Right. Well, you know what, that's, that's all nice and fun and everything. But, we'll, you know, but, uh, speaking uh, professionally, you know, the videos that get the most views are the nice polished ones that seem like it's a fantasy. So you got to be careful to not lose yourself in that environment. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's a downward spiral from that because there's so many people that look at that and really believe it's the truth. It's not, guys. It's not. <laughs> Very true. 
So Alex, let's talk about how you were actually able to create income when you first started your career and how do you continue to create income today? Yeah. So when I first started, the first three years was no money. It was me using my savings for three years is what it was. And somehow I was able to do it. I was eating canned beans on the road. I was camping everywhere. I was doing couch surfing. I was meeting people randomly. I was sharing costs of hostels of rooms. I was sneaking into uh, to national parks, sneaking in late at night, leaving early in the morning. Yeah. So I was doing everything possible not to spend money. And that allowed me to travel for a long time. And that created a lot of content for me. So the way that money started coming in is, you know, first of all, people would house me, people would give me food. I remember I was in Alaska and I was just driving. I saw this, this camper van and I stopped over and I saw a lot of scooby gear. And uh, I asked the guy, hey, that looks like a really cool thing you're doing. What are you doing? He's like, well, I'm going to go scuba with polar bears. I mean, with grizzly bears, sorry. I'm going to go see their salmon hunting and everything. It's very cool. And I said, wow. And he says, what are you doing? Well, I'm doing a lot of things. He's like, wow, that's really cool. It's like, here, I have, I have a bunch of food I'm not going to eat. You want it? I'm like, sure. And uh, he gave me a bunch of food. So funny enough, this guy was actually, I didn't know this until two years later. This guy was, his name is Paul Nicklin. He's one of the best photographers for National Geographic. You always see his stuff on polar bears and bears all over the world. I had no idea who he was, but he was just so friendly because he was kind of inspired by my story, just giving me stuff. So that was my first way of getting some sort of income. It was just survival <laughs> food is what it was. Eventually, the blog, I had a few ads in the blog, the blog I used to write. So I got maybe, oh, over the course of two, three years, I got maybe $500 over, um, over the course of three years on ads on my blog. Eventually, that became the videos, and the videos is really where the money came in. That's you know, this was back in 2014, so ad revenue was a little better for the for the YouTube video. So I got an, a good amount of money off my viral videos, which allowed me to travel for another year and a half. And then eventually, the branded projects came in, and you know, that's companies looking to work with you in some way, in some capacity, tourism boards, blah blah blah. And then also, the income comes from selling licenses to my videos and my pictures for like commercials for Google and stuff like that. They they usually find my viral videos and they license out 10 seconds to three seconds uh, of the content. So that's one of the ways I, I produce financial stability. Yeah, it's been a long journey for you. And a lot of people will think this just happened fast and you received all of these successes and the viral videos really quickly. I mean, the one that really hit big was was your selfies video that you took from all over the world. And that took a few years to do. It took, you said, what, three years? So it was a lot of work to do that. Yeah, if you go on YouTube and you search three-year selfie, you're going to get my video on there, the first one. And yeah, it was not only it took me, it took me about two and a half, two years to film. Then it took me another six months to edit because I didn't know how to edit at that time. I just YouTube how to, how to edit videos. Then was finding the song, which still took another three months. So yeah, it's a process. And that's what I like to tell everybody is if you think you're going to get online on social media and say, oh, I have this really great picture. It's going to go viral. It's most likely not going to go viral. And you're not going to start making money on social media and digital media within the first year, really. It took me... Nowadays, You can, if you really work hard in a year, you can establish yourself and then you can start making some good income. But it takes about at least a minimum of a year of investment on your end in content and what producing and creating traction to really, really start seeing the, um, the payoff financially. Absolutely. It takes so much hours to do. And especially if you're still at your day job and you're doing this, maybe you don't have the financial stability to be able to hire someone to do your editing or writing, any of those things. It will take a long time for you to do that. So just beware that success doesn't come at a very low price. It comes at a very high price. And sometimes there's a lot of sacrifices you have to make in order to do it. But if you really love it, that's what's going to keep you going, even if you're not making money and you're exhausted all the time. <laughs> I think I think the key word there is sacrifice because it, it truly is. And here's the funny thing is that most of us who are on social media and have quite a good amount of success, I would say a good 70 to 80% of us all start because we have that one viral thing that picks up 50,000 views, 20,000 views. In my case, it was 2 million views. But you have that one initial spark and you say, wow, that's really cool. That makes me feel good. I was able to produce something that was great, people liked. And that's that first initial spark where you say, mm, I could do this or I can't do this. Absolutely. I mean, that's really what's going to keep you going is that passion that you have. 
because it's not always pretty. And I mean, once you get it going, it becomes more stabilized. But in the beginning, and even when when you have it going, there's still a lot of ups and downs. So it's just what you love about it, the process and the project you're doing as well. That's right. So Alex, let's fast forward to 50 years from now and you're looking back at your life. What legacy would you like to leave and what do you want to be remembered for? <laughs> well, listen, I've always had this dream and people ask me, why do you keep doing what you're doing? And I said, well, you know what? I'm inspiring. I'm making people think differently about their lives. You know, we're in the very first generation, I think, that our passion can become our job. And, you know, this 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 way of living online and digitally wasn't available to us 10, 15 years ago at all. So it's it's really great that our generation is able to experience this type of life. And that's why our parents, again, going back to that question, uh, weren't so much in agreement to what we do because it's it's just an unknown territory. We don't know how this is going to play out. So 50 years from now, who knows what's going to happen? Who knows if this is going to fizzle out in the next five, seven years because social media is becoming very saturated. And in order to kind of you know maintain your financial stability, you know, you have all this other competition, you have all these other mediums of distribution, and it's all gradually changing. So who knows what's going to happen in 50 years. But what I do know that will stay is video, is visual stimuli, is a story. Storytelling has been around forever. So visual storytelling to me, I think, is the future. And it's where it's always been and it will always be to some extent. So my legacy in my mind is if I'm able to say, I have lived the most epic life I can be able to live and do amazing things I'll never forget and have stories to share with people and have it live for eternity, which is the internet in this case, then, you know, I think I did a, you know, if I inspired as many people as I think I could have inspired or helped as a medical practitioner, I would have completed my job, my, my contribution to society in a certain way. And what I do a lot, Debbie, is I do social work and I'm helping organizations and, and charities uh, when I travel either through my webpage or I go in person or I showcase it online. So if I do a combination of keeping myself happy, of showcasing that, of, of being able to help and inspire others in some way, I'm a happy camper. And I have a, a, a little secret. And when I'm dead, when I pass away, my goal is to just have people show up for a two hour funeral. And what I would do is leave all the best videos that I've ever made for my entire life and just have people sit down and enjoy the beauty of the earth and the world and experiences I had for, you know, 50 years of my life all through the digital media spectrum. That is going to be an epic funeral. <laughs> <laughs> just like the epic selfie. I'm going for the epic funeral. Yeah. And it's, it's really crazy because now in our generation, there's so many images and so many videos of us. I can't even imagine what it's going to be like 50 years from now and what type of mediums are going to come out and also showcasing the work that we're doing now and just reliving all of that stuff. Right. And seeing yourself as a younger person, what you did, like, are you going to be super proud of that moment? Are you even going to remember it? Like what's going to stand out? So it's pretty incredible where we are. And you're right. We are at a time where we can actually create a career from what we are passionate about. And before, when you were a creative, you were an artist People always said you were going to be starving. Now you make so much money from it. It's actually the creatives that are making the most money. So it's pretty interesting. Yeah, for sure. That's uh, The tables have kind of turned in a different yeah. way. You know, I think uh, what's really funny, I saw a statistic the other day and it said, in two seconds, more pictures taken on a camera that are uploaded on the internet than uh, I think there's ever been in the history of humankind or something like that. It was, it was something weird where it kind of makes it go like, wow, it's like, I wonder what's going to happen in 10, 15 years from now if we're doing that already. Yeah, it's it's crazy the amount, right, the, of content that's being popped out of of everyone. Yeah, and that's a problem as well, too, because we come so – what's happening is like, um, like the way the magazines used to happen. We used to see magazines, and we think people look like that, but they're airbrushed or Photoshopped. They look like perfect. So we're, we've just gotten so used to it now that we don't re realize that. We don't remember that, you know, the actual image – uh, is way different in the true reality. And the same thing I think is happening with us now is that we're just consuming so much content at such a high rate that we're numbing ourselves and we're forgetting. And, and, and we're now living. There's a great meme I posted on my Instagram uh, this week, and it said 15 years ago, we used to go to the Internet to escape reality. 
Now we go to reality to escape the internet. <laughs> and it's a really funny meme. It's, uh, it's, it really makes you think because, wow, it's, it's funny how things have twisted and turned so much. That is really true, actually. It's sad, but very, very true. And I hope it doesn't become like that all the time, but it has. So that's sad. It is. It is. Aww. Well, hopefully, you know, you'll find some little window of hope. And, you know, if social media is your thing, that's great. And uh, make sure to follow people that are authentic and true and organic and keep you a little grounded. Yeah. Well, hopefully, if there's anyone left out there. <laughs> yeah, you can just go to my page and if you like it, I like it follow me because I can yeah. do some of that follow, stuff. Follow follow Alex. There you go. A little shameless health promotion there. <laughs> yeah. So Alex, what are you currently working on that's really exciting to you? Yeah. So currently working, what this uh, platform has allowed me to do is, you know, make the jump to TV. I think that's, that's a nice little avenue that'll always be around. So that's all my major things to do. But while I do that little thing of TV, you know, I continually travel the world in different ways. It's not always on the motorcycle. And if I do on the motorcycle, I don't showcase the motorcycle as much. So you're going to see travels like, you know, it's just gonna, like I'm going to Mexico next week for two months and I'm going to do great videos like, you know, what $10 can get you in Mexico, you know, what's a cenote and why you need to know about it or, you know, how to travel. Is Mexico safe to travel to? So, you know, giving people resources and education and some sort of entertainment here in Mexico for the next two months is the next project. That sounds really exciting. And I can't wait to see all of those videos that you're going to be doing in Mexico. So Alex, if our listeners want to know more about you, where can they find you? Yeah. So if you guys are interested in anything that I'm doing, it'd be great to have you along for the ride and the adventure. You can find me as Alex Chacon, that's C-H-A-C-O-N on Instagram, uh, Alex Chacon Official. Facebook is Alex Chacon. And on YouTube, Alex Chacon. If you want to see my most viral video, which is just you do, it'll It'll inspire you to get off the couch and maybe go out for a run or walk your dog or um, even think about taking a trip for the weekend or for the summer. Just search Three Year Selfie on YouTube and you'll find me. Perfect. Thank you so much, Alex, for being here with us. I really appreciate it. Maybe thank you so much for inviting me on the program and can't wait to see you again on the road. Yeah. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this interview with Alex. Make sure to visit theoffbeatlife.com. Again, that's theoffbeatlife.com to get the extended interview with Alex where he shares how to create a viral video on YouTube. Hey, Offbeat family, I really appreciate you listening to this episode. I would love to hear more from you and what you think of the podcast suggestions on guests, topics we can discuss, or maybe you just want to be friends. Why don't we chat some more on Facebook at The OB Life or send me a message at hello at theoffbeatlife.com. I can't wait to hear from you.